Good evening and welcome to Low Observatory and our coverage of International Observe the Moon Night. Uh, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm the historian here at Low Observatory, and I'm joined by one of our outstanding educators, Hello. Wesley Sotomayor. Hello. And for the next half an hour or so, we're going to celebrate the moon. We're going to talk a little bit about um, mythology, a little bit about science, and then we'll end by talking about Low Observatory specific contributions to helping to uh, explore the moon in the 1960s and 70s as part of the Apollo program. Um, so we are glad you joined us. Um, this is very informal and interactive. So if you have questions as we go throughout the evening, um, just, just post them on the YouTube and our crack behind the scenes team will get those questions to us and we'll try to get as many as we can. Um, so to start off with, um, we're, we're just gonna chat first about, about the culture of the moon because before there was science, before they were studying the moon, there were just people like us looking up at the moon um, and wondering about it, wondering, wondering what it meant. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that mythology a little bit. Uh, Wesley, you wanna tell yes, a little bit about that? Certainly. Um, it looks really cool, obviously. You can just look up in the night sky and it's big and bright and obvious. And it doesn't have quite a, as much of a direct impact on our lives as the sun does. But it's another really big, bright thing out there. And so people have always been very interested in what's going on with it. Uh, there are lots of different myths from all around the world, um, a lot with rabbits, actually. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very common myth in lots of Asian traditions that originates in the Chinese tradition um, of a, a rabbit living on the moon that makes immortality potions. I'm not sure where that exact interpretation comes from, but it's interesting. Um, some of the mare or what they see as the, the rabbit. You can like see the rabbit in there. There's some other cultures that say man in the moon, which is kind of interesting. Um, the Aztecs also saw a rabbit on the moon, which I always think is really, really cool when you have cultures like from mm -hmm. very different parts of the world that look at the same stuff in the night sky and they're like, eh, it kind of looks like this. And that's kind of like what we do looking at clouds. Uh, we, we see familiar things to us. Yeah. Like the word paradroia or something close to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, we do it with clouds, with the constellations. Mm -hmm. um, the Big Dipper in England is a plow. Um, to Native American groups, is different things. So the same with the moon. Yeah, different yeah, yeah. cultures looked at and had different stories. Exactly. Yeah, it's always really, really interesting. Um, one of a very common thing to talk about during Halloween is you know werewolves. And of course, werewolves come out during the full moon. They're casting. <laughs> exactly, werewolves. <laughs> um, and the, the wild thing is that there, it's, it's like a really, really, really old mm -hmm. tradition story thing. Um, it comes from the Greek. Lycanthropy is, is Greek for uh, wolf man. I think literally is Greek for wolf man. Or no, werewolf is man wolf. Lycanthropy mm -hmm. is wolf something. I, my Greek is rusty. Mm -hmm. But uh, in ancient Greek, Greece, there was this uh, sort of folk tradition that if you were to sleep outside during the full moon, you would turn into a wolf. And there's, of course, we can't forget the wolf man. Even a man who's pure at heart and says his prayers at night can turn into the wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the moon is full and bright. Yes, obviously. Of course. I, I've watched the old movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Yes, you know all your you know all of your wolf. All the important clearly. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all, all well, you are a historian, so yeah, it's, it's, a wide. Yeah. Wide so, birth. So the, the moon is really, is part of everyday life. I mean, it's something we take for granted, but mm. it, it has to do with time. It has to do with, you know, some, some people think how we behave. Yeah, um, So yeah, maybe yeah. talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so in, in the original Greek, which is where the Romans stole all their stuff from, the moon goddess was called Selene, and she was the brother of Helios, and, and since Helios is sometimes Apollo, and one of those two gods, depending on which exact story you hear, is the one who carries the sun chariot across mm -hmm. the sky, or drives the sun chariot across the sky, I suppose. And Selene, or Artemis, is the one who drives the moon chariot across the sky. They're twins, and so sun and moon, it all makes sense. Um, and so in the Roman tradition, there's this goddess Luna, who is also attributed to people doing crazy things at night when the moon would be out. There was, the moon was attributed to people losing their minds and, and going crazy. It's where the word lunacy or lunatic comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a big part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we maybe talk about the time a little bit. You know, we, so much of our daily hours or, you know, a year is based on the earth going around the sun one time and a day is the sun spinning on its axis mm -hmm. once and then what and then there's the moon the moon is roughly going to change through 
a full phase change in about two weeks, give or take ish, which means that two of them usually ends up being a month. And so that was a common way to measure months in a lot of different traditions. Um, believe the word month and the word moon have something etymologically to do with each other, though I, I don't know enough about that to say anything definitive, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they're related in some very specific way, which is really cool. And, and, the, one, and the moon is also um, um, the origin of some names that we have. Yeah, have yeah, the yeah. Days of the week are mm -hmm. named after the planets. Yes, so yeah, not, yeah. The, the known planets back then, what mm. were believed to be the, um, not as we consider today, but the sun was considered a planet, the moon was, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it really is part of our everyday lives and we don't even think about it sometimes. Yeah, 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 just ever present yeah. all the time. It's also really interesting, eclipses are, a, a, if any of you have ever seen an eclipse, they're incredible phenomena, they're very, very otherworldly. And so cultures everywhere that were able to see them and many could predict them, which is the coolest thing, um, obviously thought they were pretty otherworldly and interesting. And we're very lucky that we can experience them at all in the way that we can, because our moon and, our moon and the sun just sort of happen to be the right set of mm -hmm. sizes and distances away from us that one can appear to go in front of the other. It's really remarkable that the 400, I think it is, where the, the sun is 400 times, appears 400 times bigger than the moon, mm -hmm. but it's also 400 times further away. So I we just that happen yeah, to yeah, live yeah. in that time. It's so interesting, yeah. So, yeah. And it won't always be like that. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about it. Let's transition into science a little bit. and you know, what happens with eclipses and, yeah. and then talk about phases of the moon. Mm -hmm. So in an eclipse, lots of people may inadvertently say that in some eclipses, the sun goes in front of the moon. Mm -hmm. If that happens, you uh, uh, call your insurance provider probably. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't generally happen. Uh, in a solar eclipse, uh, the, I can't recall off the top of my head exactly the difference between solar and lunar eclipses, but it's when the moon goes in front of the sun and they just appear to cover each other. Do you right? A, a lunar eclipse happens um, only at full moon mm -hmm. when the moon is opposite the sun in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you have the sun on one side, the Earth in the middle, and the moon on the other. Yeah, and, and then, so then uh, you get the Earth's shadow right. on. And top then a of new that. moon can only happen. Um, um, I mean, uh, a um, solar eclipse solar can only happen, only happen on a new moon. A new moon yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, so, and, and what you said is, is right, the ancients were able to predict these things. They were pretty smart people. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Before we had telescopes or anything like that, in fact, the word planets is Greek for the, the wanderers. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Because they, they noticed them wandering across the sky, and they made a lot of really pretty impressive um, Yeah, it's really incredible how, how yeah. well these things could be predicted, like, way, way ahead of time. Right. So what, what other science about the moon? Maybe something we learned from Apollo, um, you know, the origin of the moon, we think, um, based on based on what we learned about the moon. Yes, yeah. Uh, it was some sort of large planetoid crashing into the Earth during the heavy bombardment period. Right, yeah, yeah maybe yeah. a, a Mars-type thing, Mars-sized mm -hmm. thing that bashed in and blew some Rip, of the upper part apart. of Earth yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is so crazy to think about how intense that early solar system era was right. of all this, like, just stuff flying everywhere. Yeah. yeah, and you know that's something that we learned from going to the moon. And you know you can learn a lot just by the unaided eye, mm -hmm. and that's what the ancients did. Then with the advent of telescopes, we're able to look closer at the moon and see see um, details, uh, craters and canyons, mm -hmm. and um, all sorts of things. But going to the moon allowed us to actually collect samples. Yeah, learn and how to analyze a lot more them, about it, yeah. and that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. And and in fact, when we talked about going to the moon, um, Flagstaff played a really big role with that. Yeah, that's exactly right. That was always an interesting thing for me. Right. To out so it's we're, really we're cool. gonna we're gonna play a short video here. I'm just kind of highlighting this, and then we'll talk specifically about how Lowell Observatory um, helped get us to the moon. So let's watch that video. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The first astronauts to go to the moon were on Apollo 8, and that was December of 1968. They orbited around the planet. They didn't land. As they got, got across and saw Earth for the first time, it was this blue circle in the emptiness of space, and it really made them realize, oh my gosh, all of humankind, everything that we know is right in that little circle that we're looking at from so far away. 
It all started out uh, with Gene Shoemaker, who is a, was a brilliant geologist, and uh, he was fascinated by mapping the moon and craters on it. The whole concept of, of going out and studying the moon was, was just out of this world. He said, you know, what's the point of going there if we just plant a flag? Let's do science. So Flagstaff really played a big role in Guineas to the Moon. Um, we saw um, several places that flashed up, Meteor Crater, Sunset Crater, the Grand Canyon, uh, volcanic fields around Northern Arizona. And, you know, here we're, we're here at Lowell Observatory. Um, so heck, we should talk about Lowell Observatory and, and our role in getting there because it was, it was uh, important. Um, if we go back to the early 1960s, when there was talk, starting to be talk about going to the moon, um, and even before President Kennedy challenged the country that by the end of the decade, we would send humans there and bring them back safely. Um, even a little bit before that, uh, people like this uh, gentleman shown here, his name is Gerard Kuiper, and he was a great American astronomer, and he was developing um, images and maps of the moon. And these were based on observations through telescopes uh, for the most part. And then we started getting some spacecraft like Ranger and Surveyor up there eventually. Um, but he realized, you know, eventually if we're gonna go to the moon, we need even more detailed maps. And he got an idea that why don't we look through telescopes? And so we have these basic images of the moon, look through telescopes uh, and just, you know, stare at a while and wait for those moments of really good seeing. It could be just a, a split second when the atmospheric conditions are all right and, and just right and you get a really crisp, view of the moon. And then based on that view, um, sketching the details. And so um, he suggested um, going to Arizona to do this. And this seemed like a, uh, a good idea. They um, first talked to the Naval Observatory here in Flagstaff. And this is kind of a neat picture because this is a modern day picture of the Naval Observatory. And you see a big ship's anchor um, just to the right of the dome, which you don't expect at 7,000 feet elevation. Um, but they, they tried this out here with one of the Naval Observatory's telescopes and found that, yes, in fact, if we can use telescopes to um, refine our views, we can really make exquisitely detailed maps. The problem is the Naval Observatory didn't have an available telescope. And so the director there said, hey, go talk to the director of Lowell Observatory. They have this 24-inch refracting telescope. It's the one that Percival Lowell um, used for his Mars observations. It's the one that Vesto Slifer used to first detect the expanding universe. It has a long heritage research, but by the 1960s, it wasn't being used too much because um, even though Flagstaff skies are dark um, and there's a lot of lighting ordinances, you know, we're just right above town, less than half a mile away. And so the telescope wasn't being used for research anymore, but hey, it's perfect for looking at the moon because you don't need exceptionally dark skies for that to look at the moon. It's pretty bright. It's pretty bright. <laughs> and so they did this. Um, they brought both scientists and artists um, that they would observe through the moon through the telescope, initially the Clark telescope. And again, sketching details at, at the eyepiece. And then back in the office, using airbrushes and, um, and pictures that they had taken, um, they would sketch in details. Um, here's Patricia Bridges who was uh, for years the main illustrator here. Years later, Jay Inge was, was the main one. And she has a glove on her right hand and she's holding an airbrush. Um, it's it's kind of hard to see, but you see a little, a little line going down from her glove. That's where the air is coming in from a tank. So, so they made these, these maps and they were exquisite. Um, this is one of the maps showing Copernicus. And this is all by hand. I mean, this is really remarkable, every detail here. And they even did it so that um, you can see shadows on there. Those shadows are the same that, they, that the astronauts would see. So they're making this drawing at the same angle of the sun that the astronauts would see uh, when they flew over. So that was a really important consideration for them. And so the mapping went really well. And initially 
they used the old 24 inch refractor. And then the, the building they used was this white building you can see here with folks standing in front of it. And, and there were several offices in there. And so it was only a hundred yards to get up to the telescope. Um, so they could go back and forth pretty easily. And of course, this is while other research is going on at Lowell Observatory. Well, by the mid 1960s, the team had grown and here's, I don't know, a dozen or so people here. Um, they were really cranking out the maps and I say cranking out, this was not a fast process. <laughs> this was, you know, very painstaking. It took a lot of um, talent. Pat Bridges was a scientific illustrator. Um, and there were some others involved also. But um, this, was, this was a very detailed process. It had to be accurate. But they were creating these incredible maps. Um, it, if you go up to Loeb's Observatory today, as you drive up Mars Hill, you go through two stone pillars. And then the first building you'll see on your left, this is the corner of it, this still stands. This is now our business office building, um, but that's, that was an expanded office. So they originally had this white part in the mid 60s they added the second office building right here. Um, in fact, these trees behind the people are still standing there. So the project went really well. While they expanded the office, they also thought, you know, this is great to be able to look through the telescope and capture these details of the moon, but there's only one eyepiece of a telescope. Only one person can look at a time. So let's bring in another telescope. And so they acquired um, this, uh, another uh, refracting telescope, a telescope that uses lenses um, from a family in Texas called the Morgans. Um, they brought it up to Flagstaff and, and they used this telescope also. Here's an inside view. Um, this this uh, facility is kind of neat because the entire floor is an elevator. So the whole floor goes up or down so you can get to the eyepiece. In the old Clark refracting telescope dome, there's a pitch in the floor. And so you adjust by that after getting on the ladder. In this dome, they they have the whole floor can go up or down. So again, now, now they have two different telescopes um, so they can do twice, twice the observing at one time. Did they have, were they using Percival's big fancy chair when they were doing the mapping in there, do you know? They probably used a little bit. Um, I, I haven't seen any pictures of them actually sitting on it, mm -hmm. um, but they probably used a little bit. I'd like to think so, at least. But they, Seems fun, right? You know, it does. And you know, actually when they bought this, when they brought this telescope, there was this big metal industrial looking chair that came with it. Nice. And it was it was called the electric chair. <laughs> and, and, it, we, and it was, I, they didn't need it in this dome because, because it was with the original Morgan Telescope in Texas. Mm. But in this new dome that had an elevator floor, you didn't need, you didn't need the chair. It, yeah. And so they put it into the Clark Telescope dome, and it was there up until um, the renovation we did in 2015. Oh, crazy. Yeah. So huh. you see some pictures up until 2014 or 15, and you see that historic wooden low chair and mm -hmm. then the gray electric chair. Still in there. Nice. Um, so, so they they probably use that some. Although in general, they're probably looking at the moon when it was fairly high in the sky. Makes sense. And they so, didn't use the so they didn't need it as much, but mm -hmm. they they probably used it some. And in fact, if you're familiar with the with the Clark refractor, um, the there's so many neat characteristics of it. But the you know the doors you open to look outside, the ones on the top you use uh, ropes and pulleys. And the ones on the side used to work that way, but in the 1960s, the moon mappers wanted something a little bit easier. So that's when they got airplane landing gears and installed those. Right, yeah. And, and so they, when the moon mappers were done, um, the, the top ones they had made electric also, they put those back to ropes and pulleys, <laughs> but they left the electric doors in. That's so, hysterical. <laughs> so that's a, that's a remnant of the uh, Apollo days. Nice. So this, this moon mapping project went really great. They were creating a lot of moon maps. Um, by the late 1960s, they had, they had imaged the majority of the moon. Um, plus at this time, we had other spacecraft that were able, like um, Surveyor and then the lunar orbiters. And lunar orbiters were orbiting around the sun and they could get really detailed images. So these maps weren't as critical. Mm -hmm. But the last, um, the last aspect of the moon mapping, it was finished in 1969. And by the way, this is J. Inge on the right, 
um, and Terry McCann, right next to him. Terry now lives in California. The last thing they did was to make a globe. And these, um, all these strips are, you know, you can imagine putting those all together in a sphere. Each one of those is called a gore. They put all the gores together and you get a, a, a moon globe. And um, it's just a gorgeous thing. They gave a copy to President Nixon um, as a thank you for, you know, keeping the Apollo program going. Um, and so this, this moon map in general, we have um, on exhibit here at the observatory, but it's now on temporary exhibit um, down in Southern Arizona in, in Tucson as part of a moon mapping exhibit. Or I, I think it's more than moon mapping. I think it's how we got to the moon. And then in a few months, it's going to be coming back to Flagstaff as part of a display at the Pioneer Museum. Awesome. Um, so, you know, people will be able to see it. So that moon mapping project was really successful. Um, now, while it was going on, there was something else happening also, and that was astronaut training. Because when uh, President Kennedy, when, after Ellen Shepard became the first American to go into space, in 1961, um, soon afterwards, John Kennedy um, said, you know, we've, we've been in space for 15 minutes. We essentially went up and came back down just like, um, just like um, William Shatner did a few days ago, just go up and come back down pretty much. Um, but we know how we're gonna catch up with the Russians in the space race. We're gonna send people to the moon and bring them back by the end of the decade. Um, this is gonna take a lot of technological development um, to do this. Um, and so while they're trying to fig get to figure out the rockets, they, they have the Mercury flights that were just getting up into space. Then the next program, Gemini, would allow us to learn how to dock spacecraft in space out there, um, how to get astronauts to stay alive for you know a couple weeks at a time, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of different things like that. There's so many interesting stories. Oh, it is. <laughs> And then, and then eventually the Apollo program would be going to the moon. Well, while all this is happening, you have scientists like Gene Shoemaker shown here um, in Meteor Crater and other scientists who said, you know, if all we do is go to the moon and plant the flag and say we beat the Russians, um, politically, you know, we've met our goal, but what a, what a waste scientifically. Yeah, certainly. We should go to the moon. And by the way, if we're going to send, if we're going to, go to the moon and explore the moon and do science, which is what they're pushing. Um, you know, these astronauts are test pilots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they're all fighter are, pilots, yeah. Yeah, they're not <laughs> trained in geology. In fact, several of them are, are cynical. What do picking up rocks have to do with beating Russians? And so, so it took some encouragement to get them to buy into this. <laughs> but in 1963, January 1963, NASA did a pilot trip out to Arizona with the, the second group of ast this, the next nine astronauts that included Neil Armstrong, Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, who grew up in Tucson, and some others, um, to see if it would be worth taking the astronauts in the field and teaching them geology. And so on a January day in 1963, it was really cold. Um, they first went to Meteor Crater to see what an impact crater would look like, like they see on the moon. They went to Sunset Crater um, to see um, what, you know, volcanic rocks and to not just the crater itself, but, but volcanic features because they expect to find that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And then they went to the observatory um, to see how these features are depicted on maps. And then that evening, they split up. Some of them looked through the old, uh, our 24-inch refractor. Some went to the Navy, Naval Observatory and some went to Northern Arizona University um, to, look at the, to look at the actual moon through a telescope. So on one day, they could see um, how, you know, what an actual impact crater looks like up close to practice collecting rocks and identifying rocks. They could see how these features are depicted on maps. They could see the real lunar features up close. And NASA decided this really is worthwhile. So this inspired them to bring all the astronauts out here. Every astronaut walked on the moon trained here in Northern Arizona. That's so cool. And this is uh, one of the more probably well-known astronauts. This is Jim Lovell. And this is in our old ACIC building, um, looking at a couple maps. Um, here's another uh, well-known astronaut. This is Tom Stafford, who commanded the, um, 
the setup mission for Apollo 11, he was Apollo 10. Um, this is one of our retired scientists, E.C. Slifer, um, a legend in astronomy for um, astrophotography. And then in the upper left corner is Neil Armstrong, who six years later would become the first person to walk on the moon. And I think kind of a, a fun thing just to end this um, is that when, they, when the astronauts were here, this is 1963, they all signed our guest register, which we often have on display. And if you look up here, um, January 16th, 1963, the third entry down is Neil Armstrong. Well, jump ahead 49 years and, or something like that, or yeah, 49 years. And um, here at the observatory, we had just finished building what we now call the Lowell Discovery Telescope, mm. one of the most powerful research telescopes in the world. And we brought Neil Armstrong here, Neil Armstrong, who had taken the first steps on the moon in 1969. And this is a, a still from the video. There's not really good pictures of him on the moon. Hard to get data that far yeah, back in the not very good. <laughs> and then while he was here, he was the keynote presenter um, dedicating the, the Lowell Discovery Telescope. We had 700 plus people packed in the High Country Conference Center in Flagstaff, and it was a spectacular event. Um, the day after, uh, we went, um, several staff took him out to LDT, and this is one of our scientists, Stephen Levine, um, and they put an eyepiece, oh, is that, oh my God. They put an eyepiece on the, on the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope, and Neil Armstrong looked through it. And then before, as, as if anyone needed more reason to be yes, jealous of this guy. <laughs> yeah, it's got like everything. And so as a final thing, before he left, he signed the guest register. Um, you can see a what a four from the bottom, Neil Armstrong. And he actually even put his telephone number in here, which I cut off. Um, he passed away years ago, but um, it's kind of neat that this person who is really private, he came out here um, to help us dedicate this because it was all about science and engineering. Um, so that's what he was about. Yeah. So let me stop sharing my, my uh, PowerPoint here. Just back to the program. And so that's just a little bit of, of how Lowell Observatory was involved in getting to the moon. Um, and gosh, we've, we're all, we've talked about a half an hour. We've almost used our time up, but it's amazing. You know, we've just really touched the, Tip of the iceberg. Yeah, like um, just barely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it feels like we're speeding through. We, you know, that since time immemorial, people have looked up in the sky and seen the moon. It's the most dominant thing in the sky along with the sun. And then the science we've learned through the years and then flying to the moon mm. and the role that Lowell Observatory played with that. And it's, you know, Lowell um, and Lowell staff mapped it. Um, but, you know, really... It's, it's more than a historic footnote. Yeah, it laid the no, foundation certainly. for later research. Um, and I just saw a question here from Sophia. Has anything been observed or mapped on the dark side? Um, well, we, we don't say the, the, the light, lit side or dark side. We say the near side and the far side because the part of the moon that's, that's lit or dark changes um, depending on your perspective and where the sun is and everything. Um, we always see the same side of the moon, side of the moon because it's tidally locked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the same side is always right. facing towards us. We think when the moon was young, that um, while it was still sort of liquid, the gravity of Earth pulled those denser materials mm -hmm. over here. They they solidified, and we always see the same face. But we do have spacecraft. Um, you know, orbiters have gone around the moon. The, the Russians were the first to see the far side. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in the late 50s. And we've had orbiters go around the moon. Of course, the astronauts, and their missions went around the moon. Mm -hmm. It's um, just more rocks, I promise. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not as, we don't have the mare like we have on this side, the big, ba darker mm -hmm. colored basins. And we don't have, it's it's not the same, um, but it's, it's interesting to see those. And yeah, you can, it's really cool. Sophia, you can get online and, you know, just do a Google for far side of the moon images or something like that. Um, and you can really see those pretty well. So heck, we're at 7.30. Um, so I think we'll end it for, for now. Um, anything else you'd like to say, Wesley? Uh, no, I think, I mean, there's, I could talk for yeah, hours, right. but all the different stories about stuff we learned getting to the moon. My favorite thing that I have to mention, because I think it's cool, is during one of the Apollo missions, um, mm -hmm. when we found out about cold fusion, yes. which is just the coolest thing, um, a cold welding, not cold, cold fusion, welding, cold yeah. welding. 
Cold welding. Yeah, you should look that up at home. It's really, really cool. It's really there, neat. And we found that out while we were trying to send people to the moon. And, and that's, you know, going to the moon, we learned so much. And, and really, our daily lives today um, has been so impacted by going to the moon. Absolutely. The technology, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you know, watching, watching the show. Um, yeah, 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 the technology. GPS that gets us around. The, yeah, our shoes. Like, there's so many technologies that we would never have. Yeah, it really helped us. So besides the knowledge we learned about the solar system, besides all these space spinoffs, besides the excitement of humans going to another world, I mean, there's a whole lot that we learned and we continue to learn about, about the moon. So um, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. And thanks to our crack team, uh, Cody, Maddie, and Danielle, our behind the scenes team for making everything work. And we'll see you next time as we keep exploring the night sky.